This week on the Back Table Podcast. It's very important to explore the culture of that job, understand that false promises exist, do your research and ask as many questions as you can, and more importantly, ask like-minded people. Because again, a job that's ideal for me might not be ideal for Kavi. So find a person that thinks and acts like you and ask them what they think about this job. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things intervention and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com and pretty much any podcast platform out there. Taking out med school loans had me watching every penny. I took two buses to get to campus. During my residency, I walked 20 blocks. But since I opened a Laurel Road Link checking account when I refinanced my loans, I got a crazy low rate plus a cash bonus. And all that extra money helped me finally buy my own car. Where are we going? Anywhere we want. Laurel Road for doctors. Banking insights and benefits uniquely designed for doctors. See laurelroad.com slash doctor checking for full terms and conditions. Laurel Road is a brand of KeyBank NA member FDIC. Aaron Fritz as your host again this week. I'm really excited to have the guests on today. Um, we're going to cover a great topic. Uh, which is basically, you know, g- good jobs versus bad jobs. Uh, and I have a couple of, of uh, friends on to talk about, to cover this. Uh, we have uh, here in Dallas, Texas, Reza Rajevi. Welcome, Reza. Hi. Glad to be here. We also have Kavi Devalopali. Kavi, where are you at today? That's a great question. I'm currently recording this uh, in my home in Durham, North Carolina, but I'm um, full-time on the road doing locums. We can talk about that in a little bit. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I want to want you guys to give like a little intro about yourselves, you know, kind of quickly where you trained, how long you've been in practice and where you're at today. I'm going to start with you, Kavi. Sure. So I'm about four years out of training. I did my radiology residency at University of California, San Francisco. Had a great time out there. I uh, trained with some awesome, awesome faculty and um, co-residents. And then I did my IR training at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So pretty close to where I'm living right now. Graduated in 2018. I left um, training and I took the first job I can get, which was in a traditional IRDR group uh, here in town. I was there for about two years and then had the unique opportunity to actually join an interventional cardiologist and building an OBL from the ground up. So we did that right just about the start of the pandemic. And I exited that position about a year and three months after, so September 21. And uh, I've been on the road since doing uh, locums. I now do a mix of hospital and OBL locums um, in Minnesota, Florida. And I also do some teleradiology here from home. Nice. Nice. Thank you for that. And uh, Reza, to tell us uh, where you trained, how, how long you've been in practice, where you're at today. Sure. I'm in practice uh, just short of um, eight years now. Uh, I did my residency at uh, Upstate University in Syracuse, New York, and uh, I did my fellowship at uh, Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. I trained with uh, amazing people of Miami. And um, I started with uh, academics. That was initially sounded to me that's uh, that's what I wanted to do, and then switched to uh, private practice, more of a... Um, traditional uh, IRDR group, as uh, Kavi said, and then um, finally moved to uh, uh, an OBL uh, job. And unfortunately, after COVID, I, I decided to uh, depart from that job. And right now, I'm, I'm very similar to what Kavi is doing. And uh, I do a mix of locum and uh, also diagnostic radiology. Nice. Well, um, so yeah, it sounds like you guys are both doing locums and diagnostic. I am pretty much the same, right? I mean, uh, I, I, everybody probably knows my story. I've told it uh, several times with Backtable, but I'm also covering locums for my prior group and reading some diagnostic for the uh, VA. So, uh, well, let's jump on into sort of why we want to talk about this topic. Uh, the three of us have had separate conversations about this, and I thought it'd be good to kind of give people out there who are either our age group and, and looking around for, for, for good jobs, but also the trainees who are looking for jobs and, and kind of give them some ideas of what might be red flags uh, and what might be really good opportunities that we, that we know of, have heard of. So we've, we've interviewed a good number of people on Backtable and many of them, they talk about, you know, wh- why they like their jobs, whether it be the, 
the breadth of cases that they do, or they just really like their their partners. Whether it's you know academic or private practice, seems like it doesn't really make a difference. Um, there's definitely common denominators, I think, when it comes to job satisfaction. And I'll I'll tell you my thoughts, but I want to hear from you guys first. What are the first three things that come to mind when you think of like the ideal IR job? I'm going to start with you, Reza. I think um, my intention uh, in this conversation was to uh, kind of give my own take on it. And also, uh, if we can make it uh, broader and talk about different people and what their preferences are, because a job that might look really good for me uh, yeah. might be completely uh, uh, unacceptable for somebody else. But if I want to yeah. go... With top three, personally, I would say people you work with, people you work with, people you work with. That's great. No, I totally agree. Kavi, what are you? What are your thoughts? I agree, Reza. I think that's that's entirely accurate. I think when we talk about my own shortcomings and issues with prior jobs, I often stems from relationships with other people. I know, Aaron, you probably echo that as well. I think it's important to realize, like Reza said, that one person's ideal job isn't another person's ideal job. And I think there is a trend in interventional radiology, clearly with the new residency and the type of students that we're attracting to our specialty to be more clinically focused and oriented than in the past. Yeah. And I, I think that that reflects in a lot of the voices on the podcast. And I, I think I am one of those voices. So, you know, what I, what I think of is, I think the first thing for me is the ability to have a meaningful clinic to allow for basically the development of good relationships with patients, referring physicians, and to be able to do great work that we like to do as IRs in the lab. Two, I think what Reza is saying is very important. You got to have colleagues who share your vision and who are willing to support you. I think that's key. And then the third thing that I'd like to add is I, I think it's important that every physician have a pathway for growth, basically professionally, as well as financially. I think that's important. So those would be my top three. Yeah, I think um, people you work with is definitely number one uh, from from the way I feel and the and from what I've seen. I've never heard somebody say, "Oh, money's in the top three, right? I've never heard somebody say, "Well, I got to make this much money," and that's that's my main criteria. Now, there's probably people out there that that that's the case, but I don't think that that is a priority, nor should it be. The thing, the the third thing that you mentioned, Kabi, I think is super important. It was important to me coming out was. I wanted some place to like call home and and be able to build a, a practice and a service line and have those relationships with docs. And um, I think that that's what a lot of people, especially nowadays, as you said, they're they're more clinically oriented. They come out then they don't want to just knock out the list like uh, a lot of jobs uh, you know ask us to. Is um, they they want to actually have like a full clinical practice. And so I think that. That is important. That's what we've seen, um, whether it be private practice or academic people in terms of job satisfaction. Job satisfaction is that's what the, you know. That's what they're looking for. So uh, Baratza and I did an episode last year about like when that first job doesn't work out, and we brought up a few things that I think can lead to uh, job dissatisfaction. What do you think are the top three reasons people leave their jobs in IR today? I'm gonna start with you, Kavi. Yeah, I think that's tough. I, I, that's a very tough question. I, I've been thinking about that uh, up to this moment when we recorded. I, I think, you know, there's three common ones. Um, they tend to be financial. I think, you know, the big one nowadays tends to be private equity buyouts. And um, I've had multiple friends now who've had issues with potential paths to partnership. And then there was a buyout that happened and they found themselves in a completely different scenario than, than what they had imagined. I think there's definitely personal reasons. I think some people are might be initially drawn to locations and they learn it doesn't work out for their overall life, right? We all have lives outside of medicine. And I think that's very important to keep in mind. And then there's political reasons as well. Some hospitals, you know, they, they lose contracts or job responsibilities change. But I think the way I think about it is when I think about kind of the early career IR and I think about it kind of from the clinical perspective, I, I think there's three big things. And I think at least for me, the number one thing was professional dissatisfaction with case mix and inability to grow a clinical practice. I think, I think that was a big thing. I think that took me down this huge rabbit hole of getting into the OBL world and blogging about it and meeting all these interesting people. So I think that's the first thing. I think kind of related to that too is lack of, uh, lack of autonomy. Okay, lack of autonomy is, is key. I, I know, Aaron, that's something you mentioned before um, in a prior podcast. I think a lot of us 
you know, um, whether or not we realize it are probably more entrepreneurial than we think. And I think having some sense of autonomy is key. And then finally getting to what Reza was saying, it's, it's just not having good connections or support from people in your practice, um, including some of your own IR colleagues who maybe uh, have a different mindset in terms of, you know, their job and how they go about executing it. Yeah. Th those are all good points. Uh, Reza, what do you think? Yeah. Um, I think this is a multi-layer question. A few years ago, we did a, a kind of a questionnaire and did a, a actually, uh, we actually published a paper on this. We questioned a, uh, a bunch of early career uh, interventional radiologists and uh, we asked them about different things. And um, I think in that group of people, which is going to be biased, by the way, majority of people who answered, and this takes us to another uh, topic, but majority of people who answered our questionnaire, they were ac in uh, academic positions. Unfortunately, we don't get much of correspondence from private practice IRs, and, and there are reasons for that. But about 23% of early career interventional radiologists in that particular paper, they switched their jobs. And the, the main reasons that they um, listed were the top three was uh, career advancement, meaning they were in a position and they were seeing the future is going to be as bright as they were expecting. And they decided to leave and go to a better place with, uh, with uh, other uh, promises and other um, horizons. The number two problem was uh, issues and disagreements in the practice, as Kavi and you were saying. And the number three problem was, was uh, compensation. So at least we have a group of uh, less than 100 early careers um, IRs who, uh, who responded to this. And I, I can I can uh, relate to these and I can, I can talk about all of these as, as Kabi was saying. So uh, I see, uh, again, I think uh, career advancement, not uh, the fact that um, we are going, uh, so the top talent of interventional radiologists, as Kabi was saying, especially with the new residency, they are um, uh, surgically minded uh, people who are actually more innovative and they're looking for a better way of uh, doing their job. They're uh, servicing patients. And uh, when they end up in uh, top-notch residencies or top-notch fellowships for that matter, if we take it back to the old pathway, the classic pathway. And now you have a group of fellowships and residencies that are focused on these high-end cases. When you go there, they don't tell you how many central line placement they do. They talk about how many um, tibial uh, recanalization, Y90s, right. Y90s aortic endografts, yeah. no matter wherever you go. And right. there is a mismatch of what emphasized in training of IR versus what is available in the job market. So... Yeah. When you go to a place like, let's say, Miami Vascular, for that matter, it's as if you are driving a Ferrari and all of a sudden you end up in a very respectful job, very good place, and they take you from your Ferrari and they put you in a Volvo, which is the safest car out there. But it's extremely boring. So to me, Career advancement comes down to this problem. So that part yeah. of it is our expectations as interventional radiologists, and part of it is mismatch between the jobs available, majority of jobs available, and the training of IR. So do you think we need to reset the expectations of the trainees so that they're like, hey, look, this is what to expect in private practice. It's you are going to do you know, you might do 10 perm casts in a day, it's just part of your day to day and, you know, mix in a bunch of biopsies and you might get to do one Y90 a week or something like that. I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is that we don't get a full, we, we don't get the, the full perspective or vision when we're in our training of like what's actually out there in the job market. Absolutely. Would you agree, Kavi? Yeah. I, I want to take it a step further. I, I think 
Rez is absolutely correct, and so are you, Aaron. I, I, I think there's a huge mismatch between a trainee's perception of IR and what exists out there. But the real question that I want everyone to ask themselves is why? Why does this exist, okay? And I basically spend like every day thinking about this, all right? And it's, it's kind of ridiculous. But, you know, when you fundamentally think about it, a lot of us are based in hospitals. We're trained in hospitals. We end up in hospital-based practices. And while not necessarily true for a lot of academic facilities, the fact of the matter is it's how we're economically structured as IRs fundamentally within radiology groups, which promotes this type of practice. And I'm not here to say that's bad or wrong. Okay, we, we definitely have our thoughts on it. I'm certainly on one end of the spectrum. But I think understanding the context in which we practice and what are some of the financial drivers that might result in what you're saying, Aaron, doing like 10 perm casts in a day or maybe doing one or two big cases a week, it's understanding that, right? Yeah. And I, I think it all has to do with how we're structured. And I think it's something that's not talked about a lot. Yeah. I agree, Kavi. Um, let me tell you, this is this is an inherent flaw in interventional radiology. We haven't fixed it. We became, uh, the interventional radiology became as a subspecialty, as a hired gun. At some point, we introduced the concept of clinical IR. And I, I basically admire those people who try to do uh, clinical IR in the hospital setting. But clinical means, let me, let me give you an example. So when I was in my first job, it was a very big academic center. The surgeons, the subspecialized surgeons in, an, in that academic center, they operated two days a week. They had one academic day, they had one clinic day, and they had one patient, uh, let's say upstairs visit with nurse practitioner, with trainees, radiology. You tell me with this clinical IR model, which IR department is following this model? That is clinical. Like when you, when they put you in a corner and they give you a basement office and they tell you, this is your clinic and you're going to have a day, you're going to have half a day here and you're going to see patients. And you're going to work four and a half days in IR wearing lead and dealing with uh, radiation, patient um, administration, the delays in transfer, and all of that is going to affect your productivity. That comes down to your dissatisfaction of your job when you are coming in with the concept of clinical IR. We don't practice clinical IR. The people who do they basically sacrifice from their personal life. So for somebody who is out there and they're thinking, I'm going to go practice IR clinically, they need to be ready to sacrifice their personal life. The model of clinical IR has to be introduced in a right way so there is a, a life-work balance. When I talk to some people who do uh, clinical IR, they're like, oh yeah, we start at 6 a.m. We go over cases for that day. Then we do outpatients in the morning. We do inpatients uh, in the afternoon. And around 8 p.m., we go and round on patients. That's crazy. Yeah, that's not sustainable, right? I mean, how long are you gonna do that for? Right, what percentage of current physicians in America can sustain a lifestyle like that? Let's be honest. Yeah, absolutely. Very few. And I think the important thing to kind of put that on context, those are within hospital practices, right? And oftentimes we're within radiology groups where our productivity is measured by work RVUs. And for, for better or worse, um, you know, our views are what they are. And for a lot of what we deal with in the hospital, that's important. A lot of important work that we do as IRs that's quote unquote bread and butter it's relatively less efficient to do those cases than it is to read a bunch of CT scans or MRIs. And that's not to say that there are great, you know, IR physicians doing wonderful things who have developed great clinical practices. I mean, Aaron, you've, you've had some wonderful examples here on this podcast over the, over the years, but oftentimes they, they exist because what ultimately happened is there was somebody at some point who butted heads with the diagnostic radiologist and they created that environment. 
And you get these groups that can exist in harmony where, you know, the IRs accept that they may more or less be somewhat of a loss leader, but the DRs accept that you, you need that IR to more or less maintain a contract. I think my entire contention is, I think we all need to understand and acknowledge this model and realize that's what kind of led us to this existence as, as it is right now. And hopefully we'll get to this later, but I think there are paths forward. Um, I, I think that's something that all three of us have discovered. Yeah, that's good stuff, guys. I, I wanted to jump to the next question where I want to give maybe the audience some red flags to look out for. You guys have both been through some bad job situations and looking back, were there red flags that maybe you ignored or there was, you had, you know, you had a blind side that you just kind of, in retrospect, you're like, wow, how did I miss that? But at the time, you're just excited about it because it's a new opportunity. Um, any advice on doing your due diligence and uncovering red flags to avoid a painful career move? I'm going to start with you, Reza. Okay. All right. So this is a great question. There is a factor of luck. I don't know what luck is. Um, scientists are baffled with it. We don't know how, how to define it. But there are things that you need to uh, look into in this biased world. First of all, you need to accept that the fact that the world is biased. If you don't accept that fact and you'll be like, okay, like I'm going to be fine. I did great training. I'm going to, I'm a good interventional radiologist. That's a disappointment right there. Uh, there needs to uh, be a better framework with integration of training programs and job vacancies. So pretty much, especially in a larger, more desirable academic practices, the way they decide who they are going to get for that job has nothing has very little to do with how good you are. There are a lot of different things that go into to those jobs. And I think don't take things uh, easily. You need to be aware of uh, false promises. Like very uh, personal, ex from very personal experience, I would tell you, if somebody tells you that they're going to hire you, because they want to have a vascular service line. Just hiring you does not create a vascular service line. It's prob it probably means that that person wants you to deal with the 4 p.m. Friday fistulograms. That's what they mean from vas vascular service line. They don't mean that they're going to go and start a whole new practice with co collaboration with vascular surgeons. And when it comes to these collaboration type of things, that which I love to talk about it, because as you said, Kavi, there are things that we can do. One of them is collaboration. Unfortunately, in, a, in the academic settings and big practices, because just the way they are, for example, I was in a job that uh, vascular, sur I was a salary, I was a salaried physician, but the vascular practice, uh, vascular surgeons were RVU based. So there is a conflict of interest here. There is no collaboration. You cannot create a collaboration with a vascular surgeon who owns the patients, has a very clear cut referral base because they are the vascular surgeon and they're RVU based. They're basically cutting from their kids' uh, uh, college fund if they want to collaborate with you. So uh, for me, the biggest thing is do research, a complete research before you get to the job. Uh, for me is to ask questions about if you're replacing someone, try to find that someone and ask them. And this, this is the problem with luck because a lot of people, they don't want to create a, uh, you know, they don't want to create waves. So they might not give you an honest answer. So yeah. I think if you, keep asking more and more people, you might get to the bottom of it. Don't uh, limit your uh, questions to one person or two people. Try to ask as many people because everybody has a track record and ask more and more people about the job, about the uh, practice, about your boss, about your colleagues, about how things are going around in that practice. And, um, it's very important to understand yourself and you it, it, it figuring out if you're a good fit with, for that program. 
if you need to understand the culture of the program, is it a tight culture versus a loose culture program? If you, for example, if you have a station and at some point you're tired and you put your legs on your table in front of your station, are people going to be cool with that or no? It's a simple question. What is the culture of that job? Yeah. So, so it's, it's very important to explore the culture of that job, understand that false promises exist, do your research and ask as many questions as you can. And more importantly, ask like-minded people. Because mm -hmm. again, a job that's ideal for me might not be ideal for Kavi. So find a person that thinks and acts like you and ask them what they think about this job. Kavi, what do you think about that? Reza, that was fantastic. I, I don't know how much more I have to add. I mean, those are those are great points. I, luck is Thank a huge you. part of it. I mean, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, a lot of us have constraints, uh, family, kids, wives, you know, husbands, whatever. Um, we got to be in a certain location and your opportunities are what they are in a given location. And especially coming out of training, it's kind of hard to create your own opportunity as, as I've started to do now and Reza's you've been doing, but it's hard to do initially. I, I think it is important to get the viewpoint of multiple people, right? One thing that I tell trainees is, uh, actually it's helped me a lot, um, is talking to device reps in any given market. I actually found that really useful. Um, they see everything. I mean, they're just trying to do their jobs. They work with all sorts of IRs. They, they understand a lot of the politics. They're dealing with office managers, lab managers, techs. They, they kind of see a bird's eye view. It's, it's a great, great perspective to get. I think, you know, for me and my story, it was, it was very location dependent. Um, having a spouse in the area, still in residency, I had to be here. We were, you know, long distance for four years, didn't want to keep doing that. So I, I took the first job I can get. And I remember my chair of uh, IR, division chief rather, at the time at UNC saying, you know, this is, this is a good group you're going to work with. It's a friendly guy. You know, his kids swim with my kids at the country club, you know, really great. But you may be begging on the side of the highway uh, to do angiograms uh, with the little sign um, because there's not a whole lot happening. I actually view that as an opportunity. I thought, hey, okay, this is great. It's a great opportunity to build something. But then my big red flag in that situation was, okay, is, is that practice set up for me to build something? And do the partners there want that? And I think the biggest thing I learned from that mistake was to have a vision for what it is that you're trying to accomplish, but going the step further and actually figuring out what dots you need to connect to get to that vision. And oftentimes, you know, you need buy-in, right? You need partners who are supportive. You need to be in a financial structure that warrants that type of action. And in my case, it wasn't, you know. I think in IR, we're very fortunate. I think, you know, you can, you can talk with any random IRs and you're going to have a great conversation with them because I think a lot of us are just fun, interesting people. And I think we're pretty laid back. And I think overall, we have a pretty good culture. But I think once you, you know, start digging deep and trying to figure out what your own goals and motivations are and figuring out how to get there, I think what Reza mentioned is you'll quickly understand what the incentives are and what, you know, what the framework is and what you need to do to get there and uh, potentially how that situation may not be the best for you. Yeah. And buy-in is, is huge, Kaveh, because like you may come in and say, Hey, I want to build a whole prostate practice, but you know, they're not even set up to bill for it and they don't even want to like, re nobody wants to research it. Nobody wants to hire for that. You know, they, they're thinking about what is this going to cost us in the next quarter? They don't care what it, how much it's going to make in the next, you know, three years when it, when it's fully built out. And so, there's like a lack of vision there, you know, especially with, you know, obviously like, especially with the diagnostic guys, but even within IR groups, if they're, especially if they're like 10, 15 years out, they don't see all the innovation that's happened in the last five, 10 years. They're, you know, or they just, they like their status quo and they don't want to change it. Um, and they don't want to handle your patients on call that have a complication from, you know, a prostate embolization or something. So I think buy-in is, is a key thing. The problem comes from the, um, from the mentality and type of uh, contracts that these people get with the hospitals. Yeah. Okay. Number one is, uh, I, I know Kavi has touched upon this in his um, website. Uh, it's these exclusive contracts that we haven't done anything. If we, ha we, if we didn't have exclusive contracts and an interventional radiologist was able to get into that hospital 
and build a practice of prostate artery embolization, that group might not look at it as like that. Now we have become the fat cat. We're now yeah. following the, uh, the, 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 the mouse. It's, it's a big problem. The same thing happened uh, 20 years ago when we lost the vascular uh, PAD practice. We were, yeah. like, we were like, oh, take it. And you're absolutely right. Well, I talk to friends and uh, they're like, you know, I, I, I get in touch with a lot of Miami guys and, you know, we are, we had amazing training, right? It's like yeah. a lot of people don't know like how much cancer training we get in Miami, but we get a lot of cancer training. We get a lot, we do a lot of cases. And, and at the same time, we, you know, I averaged around 250 legs in my fellowship. We did two, three legs a day. So for me, claiming that I am going to go outside and change things. Like that was my, that was my thing. You know, it was a, my, my false belief was that I am the one who is going to change things. And when you go out there, especially as you go to higher level academic jobs, which are more restricted, more in frame, everything has step by step and changing things will take forever you get into more problem. For example, like I, we had like a vascular clinic that we shared and it sounded so democratic. I, well, initially it was like you, if we have three patients coming to vascular clinic, patient one is going to go to IR, patient two is going to go to vascular surgery, patient three is gonna go to interventional cardiology. We're, we're talking about PAV. And I was like, this is the best thing that can happen. I was like, this is amazing. Well, all of a sudden we got the numbers at six months and we're like, well, what's going on? I did one PAD case in six months. Interventional cardiology did, I don't know, three. And vascular surgery did 25. I'm like, how is that possible? Well, we go and we go to the bottom of it. We find out. When you go into the EMR of that certain facility, and if you have a PAD patient, you, your only option is not sending the patient to vascular clinic, which compromised of three specialties. There is one option that's actually above, like in literally in the list of referrals, there is one option that says vascular surgery. Mm -hmm. And it's above vascular clinic. So when the provider gets on the computer to send the referral, what are they going to do? They're going to send it to the first thing they're seeing there. So majority of patients are going to go end up in the vascular surgery clinic. So you need to be aware of these. That's the bias that I'm talking about. The second yeah. thing of building and the pressure for building, you guys mentioned it very well. So for example, PAD, PAD patients are very complicated. They have different needs. You, they need to know when do they start their anticoagulation. They need to do when do they stop anticoagulation. They need to know if they need to be on antiplatelets, dual antiplatelets. When can they start walking? When they, uh, they're bleeding from their groin. Maybe you were not, you did the procedure, but you are not on call and your colleague who is on call haven't seen a PAD patient in 20 years. So how, right. how is that going to build a PAD practice if right. you don't have like-minded people in your group? And that goes, to, uh, goes back to what you guys said. Yeah, yeah, you need the support there. I'm going to switch gears just slightly because I want to touch a little bit during this episode on the OBL space um, because, you know, we've seen it. It's kind of blown up right now. I'm sure the trainees have OBLs in their cross sites as well. There's a lot of, you know, OBL practices opening up. Um, we've all heard rumors of, we, I know the three of us have had rumors of bad OBL players. I don't know about trainees and we're not going to name names, but any advice for somebody to looking to get into the OBL space, um, not to, not to start their own, but just to get a job in the OBL space. Kavi. Yeah. So I'm going to start off by saying that I, I think it's a bad idea. <laughs> I think, um, it's not popular. And, and I admit there's, there's people, you know, who have gone straight from training into the OBL. Um, but oftentimes the ones who are successful, a, you know, either, either had very advanced clinical training, number one, but two, 
have very good on-site mentorship, okay, either in their fields or similar fields are able to kind of advocate for them and, you know, help them get the opportunities needed to really develop their skills. I, you guys are further along in this pathway than I am. I'm only four years out, but I tell everyone it takes time to develop skills. And I think it's hard to get out to an outpatient practice right away. But nonetheless, I know people have done it. People are doing it. People will continue to do it and they'll be successful. So I think the things to, to look out for, the number one thing is when we're talking about bad players, we, we need to talk about money, okay? Because that's what it really comes down to. And I, I know I sound like a broken record, but a lot of things come down to that. And I think in the OBL world, unfortunately, you know, there's, you know unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately, but I've, I've, I think like you, as I've learned the hard way. So one thing that, you know, we have a lot of OBLs out here and there's a lot of IRs and non-IRs doing great work in OBLs, but there's certain actors who are, who are not doing such stellar work. And I think a lot of it derives from a profit mentality. And what ends up happening is you, you think about ways to scale your business and how could you generate money? And yes, you can have a IR doing a bunch of cases for you and you can hire an APP to have a robust clinic and you can churn and burn and you can make a lot of money. But the real money to be made for a lot of these corporate and business minded folks is getting a network of OBLs together, okay, packaging them and selling to a private equity investor at a pretty significant multiple, okay? So if you put your business hat on for a second and you think about how to do that, you wanna do so quickly, right? You wanna to try to scale and, and, and keep moving. It's a velocity of your money is a very important concept in the finance world. You don't do that by being a good doctor and spending the years it takes to develop a presence in a market and to do the right thing for patients. You try to find other mechanisms. So what ends up happening is you get you get financial buy-in from potential investor physician or physician group partners. And in the vascular world, the big, big thing is podiatry groups investing into OBLs, okay? Now, you can go on a rabbit hole talking about, if, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I definitely fall on a spectrum, but the law is the law. And the biggest thing to keep in mind is the anti-kickback statute, okay? And there's certain safe harbors. I talk about them in my blog. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. But the big thing is, you want to make sure that more than 40% of the revenue derived from a given OBL is not derived from investor partners. They're limited at 40%, okay? So you naturally have to ask yourself, if you have a corporate vascular OBL that is expanding at breakneck speed, they're going into new markets and they're just putting any other young motivated IR who has no ties to that market, they're just putting them in a clinic there and they're busy from day one, you kind of have to ask yourself, how is that possible? And oftentimes, mm -hmm. that's because they are paying more or less for referrals, okay? And I'm not going to say names, but it's pretty obvious when you, when you take around and you talk to people, you'll figure out who those actors are. And while there are great IRs working in settings like this, okay, they're wonderful people, they have great skills, a lot of them, I think, might just be oblivious to this concept. And of course, there's financial pressures. If you go on an ACR, SIR job board, I mean, come on. You really think you're going to make 700, 800 K a year on day one, banging out six atherectomies a day. It's, it's ridiculous. So I think that's a big thing to look out for. That's a big thing. Yeah. There's something that's just not right about that. Right. I, I've heard, I've actually heard the word puppy mill when it comes to some OBLs, even in the DFW market. And that's just, uh, yeah, we all know that that's bad medicine. Reza, what do you, what are your thoughts on it? Well, Kavi pretty much mentioned whatever, uh, needed um what it what is making yeah. money in obl let's let's just talk about it what what is really making yeah. money in the obl it's atherectomy okay and yeah. we got these bad players that you're mentioning there is a high percentage of uh groups out there in obls that are doing atherectomies in 100 percent of patients that's hard to compete with when the mentality the person if you if you deal like if the money comes from investors they don't care about medicine that much that you care they want a certain return on their money to be happy so yeah. if you if somebody says when you're doing the calculations for them when you're doing your pitch deck and that someone who is doing it they say okay we're gonna do 100 percent atherectomy and all of a sudden your return is gonna jump from 2k to 15k for example you know balloon angioplasty versus balloon angioplasty and the stent and atherectomy the guy is like okay i'm 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 in right 
So again, it causes a conflict of interest. It basically, it's not a viable option to, to practice medicine the way you want it. And well, the other options, you know, th there are people who are doing UFEs and they're doing very good job at UFEs and they're making, you know, they're making good, uh, good practice for themselves with doing UFEs. And, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a problem we had. I think, you know, so for example, like there is, there are these bottlenecks that we don't recognize. So for example, I think there was a research done that uh, seventy-five percent of uh, patients who had a hysterectomy, they do not remember being presented with the option of uterine artery embolization. That's a bottleneck for us. So those are the things that uh, we need to think about. It. I I think OBL is a great option for a lot of reasons. What I'm interested, maybe we can talk about, and Kavi might have more insight into it is how can we create a uh, multi-specialty OBLs? How can we as interventional radiologists with a certain set of skills collaborate with a vascular surgeon or an interventional cardiologist? Because, because there is power from these cl collaboration created, you know? Again, I, I don't wanna sound like, you know, I'm advertising for Miami Vascular, but that is the best example for you collaboration with vascular surgery, interventional cardiology, and IR has led to uh, one of the best practices of interventional radiology in this country. So what? how can we set up, and this is the bright future in my mind that I see for interventional radiology, how can we set up a uh, collaboration between all three major players, or they could be other people, you know, I, you guys know they're interventional nephrologists now. How can yeah, we set up those collaboration? Pain. Correct. Pain. Exactly. Yeah. That's another area. So how can we set up these collaborations? What do you guys think? Well, it's funny. Um, I mentioned Doug Beal earlier because it seems like they got it right in Oklahoma because you got Doug Beal working with spine surgeons, you know, and they've set up this collaborative practice, which is very clinically oriented. I mean, Doug Beal, he just did a whole episode about how he treats the underlying osteoporosis because the patient's primary care docs are not treating it. And that's how they end up coming back with subsequent fractures. And so he's like, I just treat the underlying medical disorder. And then they end up with less fractures. And that kind of perspective is something that a lot of IRs can't wrap their head around. And, um, and, I, and, I th and I'm hopeful that the new training programs are, are helping teach that sort of thing. Same thing with the other guys in Oklahoma, uh, Jim Melton, Blake Parsons and their colleagues, that's a, that is a multi-specialty practice. I went and visited those guys to learn. Uh, I forget what I was learning. Uh, so I think Philip sent me up there, but I was super impressed. I mean, they have like this, this building, it's multiple interventional cardiologists, vascular surgeons, and, and Blake, I think was the first IR. They, they're probably hiring more IRs because they realize how well they work together and complement one another's skills. And I think that that is the future of these practices, and I hope to see more of it. Kavi, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I echo those thoughts, and you know, I, I've seen both the good and the bad. I mean, I I help form a multidisciplinary practice with interventional cardiologists, and I think there's a lot of pluses that can be had. But I think Aaron, it's kind of funny. It it, it reminds me of the episode that you did with John Lipman, this the last one, where I yeah. think he talks about. I'm not sure the, his icky guy is that it. Icky guy, yeah, the, yeah. Icky guy, right, right. Yeah. And I think one of the challenges in IR is um, there's a lot we can do. I mean, there's there's so much that we can do to help a variety of different patients. And I, I think we really do well when we focus on on a particular thing. And don't get me wrong, there's people out there who've built great OBL practices doing everything. But I think, you know, when you talk about multidisciplinary collaboration, you kind of have to think about what your focus is as an IR. So I think, you know, when I think about the Miami vascular model, or I think about, you know, collaborating with vascular surgeons, cardiologists, podiatrists, even as part of a group practice where it's not violating any laws or anything like that, I think it makes sense. You're all focused on vascular care and everyone has a role to play. I, you know, but I, I think one thing that can be a little troubling is, you know, that I've noticed is when I, when I joined a cardiologist, it's like, okay, well, you, you guys are PAD focused, but then you got this IR doing a bunch of prostates and UFIs and other things. How do you, how do you kind of, you know, integrate that? And then you get into financial issues too. It's like, well, what, what value do your non-IR partners add 
to services that that you're providing where you don't necessarily need them, right? So I, you get, it's nuanced, right? It's nuanced. I do think the future is multidisciplinary group practices for IR. I think that's the way we should be going. But I think we need to figure out what each individual IR needs to figure out for themselves, what their passion is and how they can integrate potentially into models that make sense. No question. Yeah. No question. I agree with you. But you need to see what's the alternative, right? What's the alternative is that you are uh, working in a hospital setting, very limited resources, a very limited number of IRs. If you think about it, uh, your call schedule is not good because as we know, like, right, we have been out for a few years now. We know that IR call can be a disaster. So I, I think, you know, what my point was, you know, Kavi, I think this is a good thing to explore, okay? Because our alternative is not that great. Hospital-based IR is extremely difficult for different reasons. Number one is, yeah. as you said, we do a lot of things, but we did not, unfortunately, we did not gain the respect for it. You're, a, you're pretty much a scavenger of a hospital. Whoever cannot yeah. do something or they have something crazy going on, they're going to come to you at some point. But... uh we couldn't build on it. You know what I'm saying? We couldn't, we couldn't demand, and that goes back to, you know, working with diagnostic radiologists and the fact that we were scared, oh, we're going to lose the contract. What will happen if uh, this and that happens? We should have uh, had more demands. The fact that they present you every three months or so with your RVU list and say, hey, doc, you didn't pull your salary. That's not the point. You're making a lot of money with what you're doing. You're making a lot of money for the hospital. Because if you look at the fa facility uh, fees for those procedures, they're extremely high. You're making money. But when you're, your job is a regular job, a private practice job is doing like 10 biopsies and central lines a day, which are extremely well, they're they're necessary, but they don't pay well. So that right. gives you that gives your DR colleagues saying that you do not pull your weight, right? But right. that's not the truth. So I think you know we need to explore explore this idea of multi uh, specialty groups more. And I understand the challenge, and I I know what you're talking about. But I think there is some. Uh, uh, how how should I say we supplement supplement each other? We uh, we can help each other in that regard, and we can create more uh, more uh, uh, practice and more business for the group all together rather than. And we can help patients, which is number one, right? That's what we want to do. We can help patients in a better way by doing so because there are things that uh, every specialty can do better. So for me. That's what I'm looking into, and that's what I would love to uh, be a part of. Yeah. So, last question, then we'll we'll wrap up here soon. But it, so, in the in the entrepreneur world, you know, they talk a lot about when to pivot, right? And I feel like nowadays, docs coming out of training, they're not going to spend a lifelong career at one job, one institution. Like that seems like a kind of a like an antiquated kind of. Uh, look at uh, you know medical careers, uh, given that it, it's just not the world's different now. And knowing when to pivot might be a good school, you know, like a good skill set for a physician as well, not just an entrepreneur. Uh, any advice on how to when to reflect on your life and your job situation, whether it be trust your gut, you know, or like you were saying, Resi, we talk about mentorship, reaching out to a mentor. Uh, Re Resi, you want you want to touch on that? Okay. So uh, in the tech world, changing jobs is very routine. People right. go to Facebook and six months later, they get a job offer from a startup with 20% shares and this and that. And six months, uh, they're very, you know, if you look at uh, the uh, CV uh, of uh, people in tech world, you can see that they change jobs very often. This is not the way it is in medical world. Yeah. For people, for hiring, like for people in administration, changing jobs too often, it's it's frowned upon, right? 
And that's unfortunately how it is. So I feel like, number one, you pivot. First of all, don't pivot too fast. Number two, decide to pivot when the ideal situation comes. You know, people talk about this ideal situation, you know, location, salary, job satisfaction, work-life balance in general. You cannot have all four, but you might go for three out of four. So I think you should pivot that you, when you are sure that at least you get three out of four, okay? I don't think it's a smart idea to pivot very fast and too often in medicine. Yeah, yeah. I want, I want you to touch on mentorship in a minute, but I want to let Kavi touch. Uh, I want to hear what he has to say on this. I know all about pivoting. I've done it a couple yeah. times now in, in four years. I, I think, you know, what it comes down to is, you know, the moment you start having negative feelings about your job, and oftentimes that'll reflect when you come home, you don't, you don't want to bring your, your work life into your house. Um, I think is a moment you need to reach out to someone. And I think that's when mentorship, you know, really matters. I think, you know, someone in IR, one of us, you know, anyone really you need to figure out why that is. Okay. Because what you really want to avoid is you want to avoid that office space moment. You know, I'm talking about, uh, I don't know if you guys seen that movie, but when Peter's there at his desk gutting a fish, just totally checked out. Yeah. You want to avoid that moment. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and I've had that moment and it's, it's not, it's, it's not dark. great. I, yeah. It's dark. Yeah. It's very dark. I, I mean, I remember, you know, driving into work and just, just dreading that first job, just dreading, just getting out of my car and getting ready to do that first declot or whatever. I just, ah, oh, it's the worst. And you want to avoid that. And I think, you know, in general, it's, it's pretty hard to get there usually within less than a year. I, I think previous advice has been wait at least a year. Generally, I, I think usually give a situation a year. And I, I think that's something that that's good advice, but you, you never want to get to that moment. I think you need to reach out and talk about it and really explore what it is. And I, I think it's, it's a moment to really reflect and figure out why you got to that moment. Yeah. Reza, you and I and Asim have talked about mentorship before over, over yes, drinks and yes. the lack thereof in, in training yeah. and stuff. What do you, what do you, how important do you feel like mentorship is in, in our careers? Okay. So, um, building something is much harder than tearing it down. Okay. We're not perfect. We're not, none of us can be, can claim that, you know, I'm a great interventional radiologist. I'm a great person to work with. And I'm like, you know, the most helpful person. Okay. We're going to all have our flaws and our weaknesses and our strength. Mentorship has to be chosen accordingly. If a person is interested in academic jobs, your mentor cannot be someone who never experienced an academic job. How is he gonna, he or she going to give you a, advice on you getting academic jobs? If your mentor has lived all their life in, I don't know, in a large city, like a multi-million population city, how do they gonna know how it feels to live in a city with 100,000 people? This is the problem with mentorship. This is what these, all these efforts with mentorship has failed because we don't have a, uh, a mechanism to look for the right mentor. If you're a foreign graduate and you have certain experiences in your life, right? Let's say your personal life, you had problems and you, you grow up. It, like, let's say I grow up from two years of age to 10 years of age, I was in a war. I grew up in a war, okay? What you see in the TV, that was my life for eight years. And nobody knew about it. We didn't have internet. There was no Instagram. There was no Facebook. There was no CNN covering what's going on. So how is that possible who, for someone who never experienced that in their personal life to be a great mentor for you? We need to change the whole foundation of mentorship. You need to look for people, as I mentioned before, with the experiences similar to you, with the culture similar to you, with the mentality similar to you. Since I started a uh, private practice, I invented a medical device. I'm in the process of working. I work with three major in private practice, right? 
I work with three major academic centers with their mechanical engineering, with their animal lab, with their different uh, areas doing my research. It makes me so satisfied because that's what I wanted. And I felt like, you know, when you go to a small size academic program, although they entertain the option of research, we have never, again, inherent problem of interventional radiology. We never really define the role of research and how it's going to be a part of somebody's career in research. A lot of people who do research, exactly like the clinical IR model I said, they actually sacrifice from their personal life to do research. Right. Until we don't fix these inherent problems, I don't think, and think about it, I don't think people are going to be much satisfied with their job in different, you know, because of different reasons in different positions. So the problem has to be fixed from bottom up. Yeah, I think, you know, we just did, we covered this with Bob Ogle Zhang and Eric Hill, and they did, they covered it very well in that it's not just something you're assigned. It's, it's something that organically has to happen. And like you said, it's almost serendipity, like you come across the person who has similar life experiences, like-minded, views the world in a similar way, so that when you are maybe off a bit and you need a fresh perspective or you need to reset your perspective, that person is, is a solid place, a solid person to turn to, to kind of help get you your bearings straight, right? Because um, it's it's like a life coach, basically, is what it is. You know, we, you know, these executives, they have these executive coaches and, uh, you know, you could almost argue that every doc needs an executive coach. We rely on mentors that usually we find during training and some of us are lucky enough to find one. Some of us are not. Um, and, and, it, and I think you should never stop looking. And honestly, you might come across one later in age where you just somebody else, and it might even be a peer. It's not necessarily somebody older than you or with more experience. And so I think mentorship is essential. It's not a buzz. It, it's a buzzword, but it's not. It's something that's essential to our careers for for longevity's sake. Because if you don't have something to turn to, you're just gonna burn out. You know. Right. Here's an idea for you. You can. We can. You need to have a AI powered. I was algorithm. just thinking the same thing, man. AI powered algorithm to match trainees and mentees with mentors. Here is yeah. here's an idea for you. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a great idea. I mean, it, it look, they're using it for dating. Why not use it for mentorship? Absolutely. Right? They use it for uh they use it for uh credit approval. They use it for loan yeah. approval. You know, if you define that people like if you define the uh, uh variables correctly, you can have a powerful tool that you don't have to be uh thinking about luck or did I get lucky in finding my mentor? I, I did it. Yeah, so Ray Dalio has this principles you. Have you guys heard of that? It's like a, it's kind of like a personality test and it's free and it's online. I just took it the other day, but it, it basically gives you a readout of like it's self it's all about self-awareness, right? It gives you a readout about like who you are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. And you just take that data and try to, you know, like you said, take some sort of algorithm and match it up with somebody who's a good fit for you. It it could be a a great project. Thanks, guys, for joining me. This is a great discussion. I, I really enjoyed it. I think a lot of great pearls here for, for trainees and, and people out there. And hope to get you guys back on the show for, for something else here soon. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having uh, me on. It was great. It was great talking to you guys, Kavi, Aaron. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Aaron. This has been awesome. Um, it's been great to, great to share. Yeah. Sorry, Kavi. One more thing. I forgot to plug your Line Monkey blog. So for the listeners, if you haven't seen it already on uh, social media or online, uh, is it linemonkey.com? It's uh, linemonkeymd.com. Linemonkeymd.com. A lot of, you know, Kavi gives great uh, insight on all, a lot of, you know, the issues that affect IR today and, uh, and, and private practice especially and, and covers a lot of the things that we cover today. So everybody definitely be sure to, to look it up and, and keep it as a bookmark on your, on your uh browser. So thanks again, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, 
Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Zubi Syed. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson and Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang and newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.